excited to be here. How about you? All right, good. Take your Bibles and go to John chapter 15 tonight. And uh, as you're turning there, how many Braves fans do we have in the room? Only one? I'm the only one. All the rest of the Braves fans stayed at home, I guess, to watch the game tonight. I'm not really sure about that. But I am excited the Braves are, are playing uh, tonight. Hopefully if they win, they'll make it to the World Series. And, uh, but I am glad to be in church tonight. I have uh, my favorite baseball team, the Braves. They're playing right now. Well, let's see. They'll be playing, playing here in a little while. I think the game starts at 8. And then uh, my college, uh, college collegiate football team, they're playing tonight. A big game for us, North Carolina State University. And uh, I am just thrilled that I'm, I'm not sitting at home watching the game. I'm here, and I'm in church. I uh, remember I was uh, at a church not, not terribly, terribly far from here, and uh, down in South Carolina somewhere, I won't say where, but uh, this fellow was sitting on the, on the front row, and it was a Sunday night, and uh, I went up and uh, started to introduce myself, just talking to him, and he had Super Bowl tattoos on his arms, right? He was a Patriots fan. Of course, you know the Patriots have won a lot of Super Bowls, right? And he had gotten a tattoo for every time that the Super Bowl was won by the Patriots. He had, you know, the big Super Bowl logo tattooed on his arms and all this stuff, you know? And uh, so I went up to him and was talking to him, and he was telling me about his tattoos. And, and um, anyway, he told me, he said, you know, I, I, I wasn't saved, and uh, I just uh, was just gung-ho, you know, for football and all these things. And, and uh, he said, and then, I, then I got saved, and I was still gung-ho for football, and I would never... He said, I would never come to church on a Sunday night because football was on. You with me? You understand? But you know, God had done a work in his life. It was Sunday night, and he was sitting in the front row of the church. And he told me, he said, you know what? I've just come to the realization that being in church is a whole lot more important than watching the game. And he says, and I am here every single Sunday night. You know, it's exciting, isn't it? When we give God time, to work with people, and they submit themselves to the teaching of the Word of God, their life changes, you know? Amen. Aren't you glad that God's been patient with you? Yeah. Right? I'm glad that God has been patient with me and continues to be patient with me. Are you glad He's patient with you, Jackson? Yeah, absolutely, right? We're all glad that God is patient with us. We're going to be in John chapter 15 tonight, and if you have a red letter Bible, every word in John chapter 15 is red. Most of them in John chapter 14 are red. Most of them in John chapter 16 are red. And most of them in John chapter 17 are red. And here we've got Jesus and He is talking here. And uh, it's just, uh, it's one of those passages of Scripture. I'm just, just being transparent and just being honest with you here. I just feel like I, I, I almost don't like preaching it because I just know I'm not going to do it justice. Right? There's just so much in John chapter number 15, okay? And uh, maybe you've heard some preaching on this passage before. I am sure that you have. And I know that you know many, many truths in this passage, and we won't be able to touch on them all tonight. But I want us to just look at a few things. The title of the message tonight is The Joy of Abiding in Christ. Amen. Are you glad that when you get saved, you are saved into a life of joy? Amen. You know, for many years, I thought that God, many years after I was saved, okay, I got saved when I was five years old, and for many years after being saved, I thought that God was like this cosmic killjoy up in the sky that set all these rules for me so that I couldn't go out and do the things that everybody else was doing, so that I couldn't have a good time, and so that I wouldn't have joy in my life, and I had to be this rigid, you know, following all of these rules. Did anybody ever think about God that way? I mean, I know I did, and I'm sure probably some of you have as well. But what I did didn't know is that God actually saved me into a full life of joy. And if I would submit myself to His teachings, and he, he gives me those rules and those guidances that He gives us in the Scripture, so that I might live a life full of joy. You know, if we were to, if I was to ask you tonight, you know, if we were to envision that you had a joy meter, right? And maybe zero was no joy, and 100 would be full joy. I wonder if you were to grade yourself on joy, where would you be? Where would you be? We're going to read here in John chapter 15. God's desire is that you would have a hundred. He wants you to live a joyful life. Okay? Can I just be honest with you though? As I travel and I talk to Christians and I preach in churches, you know what I find? I find a lot of people who just aren't very joyful. 
Okay? I mean, they're just down about everything. They're upset about everything. And I realize that life can be difficult. I realize that trials and circumstances can come into our life. All right? But listen, even in those circumstances, God wants you to be full of joy. And you can do that. Because joy is irrespective of our circumstances. Okay? So I want us to pick it up here. John chapter 15. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read all the way through verse number 16. You say, that's a lot of verses. Yes, it is. Let's just read them. And then we'll go back and we'll see what the Lord's trying to get to us today. All right? The Bible says, I, this is Jesus speaking, right? I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Let's read that verse again. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Wow, what a prayer verse that one is. Verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my what? Joy. That my joy, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Full. 100%. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, He may give it you. I love the portion there. It talks about joy in verse number 11. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The joy of abiding in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, the opportunity to open your word and to preach it here. Father, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. I pray that you'd help me to be able to convey the truths, Lord, that you laid on my heart uh, for tonight. Father, we love you and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Joy of abiding in Christ. How is it that you have this joy? Well, you need to be abiding in Christ. How is it then that we go about abiding in Christ so that we can have a life that is filled or full of joy. The first thing that we need to do is acknowledge our position. First thing you need to do is acknowledge your position. Look at it in verse number 2. We'll pick it up in verse number 1. The Bible says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch, what's the next two words? In me. Every branch in me. We need to acknowledge our position. Listen, if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Bible says that you are in Christ. Okay? The Bible says there, every branch in me, in Him, in Christ. Okay? Now this terminology is used all over the Scriptures. And I want us to go to the book of Ephesians and look at a couple of those. We will be coming back here, of course, to John chapter 15. So if you want to mark that, that might be a good idea. But we're going to go over to the book of Ephesians. And I just want to show you a couple of verses. We'll look at a couple of different books as well. The Bible starts off in, the, in Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful where? In Christ. in Christ. To the faithful in Christ. You see that? So the Bible says, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ. 
All right, now we're here where? In prosperity, all right? Now, you may be here. I may be here. We are in prosperity, but you are also in Christ, if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior. By the way, it is important for us to wrap our minds around the terminology that God uses to refer to the position that we have when we're saved. You are a branch in Him. All right, the Bible says here in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, we are in Christ. Christ. And what does that mean in Christ? All right, well, let's look in verse number 19 of that same chapter, chapter number 1. The Bible here is talking about uh, God showing His power through Jesus Christ. So look at it in verse number 19. The Bible says, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and all power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Where is Christ? Christ is at the right hand of the Father. Where is Christ? Christ is far above the enemy. Christ is far above the opposition. He is far above all principality, all power, all might, and all dominion. Right? Now look at it in chapter 2. The Bible says, what's the first two words? And you. And you. Where's Christ? Christ is at the right hand of the Father, far above all of those things. And he says, And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Look down at verse number 6. And has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. In what? In Christ Jesus. Listen, Jesus Christ is in heaven. He is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And so are you. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you're here, but you're also there, right? Spiritually speaking, friends, you're already in the presence of God. You are already there in the person of Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 2. Oh, I already looked at chapter 2 and verse number 6. Look in chapter 3 and verse number 6. The Bible says there that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise. What's the words? In Christ by the gospel. So how do you get in Christ? You have to understand the gospel. We went through the gospel the other day, but we'll do it again here just quickly for the review. The Bible teaches us that we are all sinners. And because of our sin, we deserve to be separated from God forever into the lake of fire. The Bible teaches that we cannot be saved by keeping the law. We cannot get to heaven by our good works, by our morality, by our church membership, by giving uh, to the church, by the good deeds that we do. The Bible says that we cannot get there because our righteousnesses fall short. So in fact, the Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, not our sins, but the very best that we can offer are as nothing but filthy rags when it comes to salvation. So the Bible teaches we're sinners, we deserve hell, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, but God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Amen? Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He went back to heaven. He was resurrected. Okay? And the Bible says very simply, if we'll put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll forgive us of our sins and He'll give us an eternal home in heaven. And by the way, He'll place you into His Son. He'll place you in Christ. So we see that we become in Christ by the gospel. This is not a doctrine that is uh, isolated to Ephesians. Turn over in your Bible to Philippians all right, chapter number 1. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, where? In Christ. In Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi. Do you see it? Alright, so the people there are at Ephesus, but in Christ. Here they're at Philippi, but they are also in Christ. We see it also in the book of Colossians. By the way, these are only a few of the places. It's all over. I'm just picking out a few. The Bible says in Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are also at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, acknowledge your position. If you want to have a life of joy, just come to terms with the fact that you are saved. Amen. Isn't that exciting? And think about that a little bit. Think about the fact that you are saved. Think about the fact that you are going to spend all of eternity in heaven. Friends, why would you not be joyful? 
I mean, in spite of anything that can happen in this world and whatever they tell you on Fox News and whatever they tell you on CNN, listen to me, although those things matter, they don't matter because you're in Christ. And you are going to spend an eternity in heaven one day. And if there is ever a reason to be joyful, and if there's ever a reason to smile, and if there's ever a reason to be happy to people, and if there's ever a reason to have a good time when you come to church, it's because you're saved. It's because you're in Christ and you ought to be excited about it. And I, don't, I hope you don't mind if I'm excited about it. Because I am. And you should be too. And I'm glad to see some of you smile. All right. Now, John chapter 15. Would you go back over there? Every branch where? In me. You are in Christ. So we ought to acknowledge that position. Now I want you to notice something else we need to acknowledge as far as our position. And we find it down to verse number 3. The Bible says there, Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. All right. Now what does this mean, ye are clean? Clean. Okay? Well, go back in your Bible to John chapter 13, and let's pick it up in verse number 4. We're going to read down, and I want you to see what it says in verse number 10, but I need to give you some context here. Okay? So John chapter 13, we'll pick it up in verse number 4. This is Jesus here. He's at the Last Supper. The Bible says, He rises from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I, do thou, what, excuse, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Amen to that, right? Now look at verse number 10. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not what? But not all. You know who was here at this point when Jesus was washing their feet that's not there in John chapter 15? Judas. Okay? So he's talking to his disciples here, right? And in chapter number 13, when Judas is present, he says, you are clean, but not all. Okay? And over in John chapter number 15, okay, he says, you are clean, with no exceptions, because Judas, Judas has already gotten up and he's already left the room. Right? Now, by implication, if you're saved, if you're in Christ, okay, you are clean. Man, that's crazy good news, isn't it? You're clean. You are literally as righteous as Christ. When you stand before God, He is not going to see your sins. He is not going to see your filth. He is only going to see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, that's good news. You, if you're in Christ, if you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you are clean. And how did you get clean? Through the word which he has spoken unto you. You probably know 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 21. I'm just going to read it here to us. The Bible says, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He took all of our sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see why it's so important to be in him? Because in Him, we are clean. We are as righteous as God. Boy, I'm telling you, that's exciting, right? Not only are you in Christ, but you have Christ's righteousness imputed to your account. And if you would think about these things just a little bit, you'd be pretty excited. Right? Now, this is not a license to sin. Okay? Romans chapter 6, 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. This is not a license to do whatever you want, but instead it's a challenge to step up to the plate and live like the person who God has created you to be. Okay? So you are in Him and you are clean. Okay? And now back in John chapter number 15, I want you to notice something else about our position. We need to know that we're in Him. We need to know that we are clean. These things are sources of joy for us in our life. And then, then I want you to notice that you are a branch. You're a branch. Okay, let's look at it here. The Bible says, every branch in me. And then look in verse number 5. The Bible says, I am the vine, ye 
are the branches. Now, I, uh, I went out here behind the trailer today and I, I brought in an illustration, right? I brought in a branch, okay? We have a nice little branch here. He was probably happier before I tore him off of the tree, right? But uh, we got a branch. And the Bible says that you are a branch, okay? Now, the whole goal of this passage here is fruit production, Okay, so I've got a wrong kind of a branch here, but just imagine for me, if you would, that it would produce fruit, all right? So we've had some little fruit dangling on, on here, this branch, okay? There's a lot of people who are trying their hardest in the Christian life to produce fruit, okay? Man, they try hard. They struggle they try, they manipulate, they work everything that they can. Sometimes they're not manipulating, man, they're just, they're just struggling, if you can. Right, if you would give me that terminology. They're just struggling in their life to produce fruit. Okay? But I, I want you to think for a moment about a branch that's just hanging out on the tree. Right? Is that branch struggling no. to stay there? It's, it's not struggling at all, actually. It's actually just very natural for the branch to just be there, hanging out in the vine, right? And just doing what it does, right? It's not struggling to stay there. It's resting there, isn't it? It's just a natural place for it to be, okay? And, and the truth of this passage is that, that God works through you, right, as a branch, and without Him, who is the vine, you can do nothing, okay? A branch apart from the vine is not going to be able to accomplish anything, okay? So here's the idea. Your branch... You're abiding in Christ. You're put in there exactly the way that you should be. Okay? And you need to rest in Him. Okay? And then you do the things that God has asked you to do. And when you do the things that God has asked you to do, you do it resting in Him. You don't have to try to produce fruit, friend. If you'll just be obedient and you'll relax and you'll rest in Him and you'll do what God tells you to do, fruit's going to happen. Fruit will happen. Now, you do have to obey. All right? You have to do what God wants you to do. But we're not striving, you see, to produce the fruit. We're not striving to get the results. And if we're striving and we're, and we're manipulating and we're, and we're working so hard and we're struggling to produce the fruit, friends, you're not abiding in Christ. You're working in the flesh. You're trying to produce fruit apart from the vine. Right? But you know, when you're just doing what a branch does, and you're just hanging out in the vine, right? And you're being joyful that you're a part of the vine, that you're in Christ, and you do the things that God tells you to do. You know what happens? You produce fruit. Isn't that kind of neat, right? So the branch, you're a branch, and that is a restful position for you. And recognize, by the way, that you're just a branch. Pastor Henry is a branch. Dustin Duke is a branch. You are a branch, and the best way for a branch to function as a branch is to realize that they're a branch. You know, the Braves, I mentioned them before the message started here tonight. Uh, they just won the National League East, and hopefully they're going to win the pennant, and hopefully they're going to be in the World Series facing off against the Astros. But can I tell you, the only reason the Braves got this far in the season is because every position on that player knew their position. They would acknowledge their position. The first baseman didn't try to do the shortstop's job. The shortstop didn't try to do the first baseman's job. The first baseman didn't try to do the manager's job. And the manager didn't try to do the owner's job. And the center fielder didn't try to do the owner's job. And the owner didn't try to do the left fielder's job. We all have a job. And our job is to simply be a branch. Okay? Listen, if you want to have the joy of abiding in Christ, we need to acknowledge our position. Okay? First, you're in Him. Second, you're clean. And third, you're a branch. And embrace the fact that you are a branch. Now, having acknowledged your position, we need for you to assess the possibilities. Assess the possibilities of being a branch. Okay? Now, the first possibility of being a branch that is in Christ is the fact that there could be no fruit. There could be no fruit. All right, we see it there in verse number 2. The Bible says, Every branch where? 
in me. So we're talking about saved people here, right? We're talking about saved people. We know we're talking about saved people. In verse number 3, you are clean. The Bible says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So it is possible to be saved. It is possible to be a branch. It is possible to be in Christ. It is possible to be seated in the heavenlies and not bear any fruit. You know, there are some people who don't believe that. But the Bible teaches that it is possible to be saved and to have no fruit to show in your life. Now what else happens here? What does the Bible talk about? Look down to verse number 6. Now the Bible says there, If a man abide not in me. The word abide means to remain. Okay? The idea here, if you're not remaining in Christ, if you're not staying in the book, if you're not doing the things that God has asked you to do, if you're not abiding in Christ, continuing in Christ. These are discipleship terminology here. If ye, uh, the Bible says in verse number 6, if a man abides not in me, continues not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now there is no reason for us here to read into this passage hellfire. It's not there. The Bible is talking to believers who are in Christ, who are a branch, but are not continuing in Christ. They're not abiding in Christ. They're not dwelling in Christ. They're not remaining in Christ. And what happens? They wither up, and they die, and men gather them, and they put them in a big pile, and they light a match to them and they burn them, right? Because basically they're worthless. By the way, I got this out the back of your house. There's a big, big pile back there because he's picked up a bunch of sticks that have fallen off the vine and he's thrown them back there, right? Listen, the possibility is that you and I as Christians can look like this. Friends, I don't want that in my life. And I know you don't want that in your life as well. But you and I probably all would know Christians who look like this. They're just not doing anything for God. They won't even make the simple choice to come to church. And because they're not in church, and because they're not sitting under the teaching and preaching of God's Word, and because they're not in the Bible themselves, and because they don't have a prayer life, and because they're not doing anything that God has commanded them to do, they're not abiding in the vine, they wither up and they die. That's sad. It's possible though for us, even though that we're in Christ, to end up having no fruit. By the way, I believe this ties right back into last night's message in the carnal Christian and the rewards being lost at the judgment seat of Christ. His whole life is going to go up in smoke. Everything that is there. And he will have no rewards to offer the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful though that's not the only possibility right, as we assess the possibilities. The first one is there is no fruit. But the second one is that there is Fruit. Right? In verse number 2, the Bible says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth fruit. So, there are fruit, fruits that we can produce in our life. What are these fruits? fruits. All right, I believe that some of them are simply the words that we say. All right, we won't go into this. If you have questions about this, I can talk to you about it later. But, but basically, the words that we say are fruit in and of themselves. The Bible talks about this, okay? And so, therefore, the doctrine that we teach, the doctrine that we preach, all right, uh, the way that you talk to your friends about the Lord Jesus Christ, that would be fruit. So, in other words, when you get saved, if you start sharing the gospel, just the words that you say, the fact that you are repeating the scriptures and the truths of the scriptures, Right? That is a fruit that a Christian can bear. Of course, there's a fruits of the Spirit over in Galatians chapter number 5. Right, Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, meekness, long-suffering. You know the list, right? Those are fruits that we can produce. And of course, there are the fruits of leading other people to salvation. Reproducing the Christian faith in the life of another. Well, I, tell you, I like that kind of fruit, rather, by the way. I like all kinds of fruit, all right? But I really like that. But by the way, you need all those other fruits in your life to be able to do that kind of fruit. You remember uh, Brother Fred Robertson that came down here a couple of years ago and taught a Sunday school class. Some of you may not remember him. He's an older gentleman, friend of mine, and I uh, was telling Pastor Henry he's the best soul winner that I've ever been around. And uh, I was talking to him today. He called me on the phone, wanted to know where I was at and what I was doing, and told him I was down here with Pastor Henry. And he said, Oh, yeah, 
he said, if I had remembered, I'd have come down. But at any rate, he didn't remember, and so he's not here, and, uh, but that's, that's okay. But he was telling me, he said, Dustin, do you remember the first time you and I went out soul winning together? And I said, of course I do, Brother Fred. We went to this apartment complex um, right down the road from, from his house in Landrum, South Carolina, and uh, we started going off there. And, and at that point in time, I, I, I would go out and I'd knock on doors, and nobody ever got saved. And he was always telling me the people was getting saved. I'm like, well, I'm going to go with you. Okay? And I uh, went with him, and sure enough, like the second or third person we talked to got saved. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on with this guy? Man, he just loves to share the gospel with people, right? And uh, so since then, I've tried to hang around with him, try to learn from him, and praise the Lord, I see people saved regularly now from just sharing the gospel and talking to them. But anyway, on this day, uh, we ran around and we met this lady and uh, we talked to her and because it's probably being recorded, I won't use her name. But anyway, we talked to her. She invited us into her home. We sat there on our couch and uh, Fred went through the gospel with her and she was listening intently and she's like, man, that sounds really good but you know, this sounds like a private decision. And so we left her some information and she said, I want to study this over and then I, if I decide I want to trust Christ, I'll, I'll do it on my own. Hey, now, by the way, people can do that, can't they? Amen? So we left the information with her and we left. I'm telling you that that woman has got to be the busiest woman, the hardest woman to track down. And she never is at her house. I mean, it is just a crazy thing. We tried to find her. We'd follow up with her for weeks and months and months and months. And never was she home. Right? So finally, uh, maybe it was uh, about five or six months later, I think it was, uh, he stopped by there one day with his wife and she was home. Five or six months later, after meeting her for the very first time. By the way, does it take some stubbornness and some persistence and follow-up and some patience in working with people who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior or even our potential candidates for accepting Christ? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. There's a lot of work. Okay? And so uh, he went back and, and she said, You know, that uh, thing you gave me, I read over that and I accepted Christ as my Savior. And they rejoiced about that and, and uh, she said she needed to come to church and so he reminded her of where the church was and all these things, right? And then it's been about a year and a half or a year and six months or something like that since that conversation with her. Never seen her. Now there's a lot of people when I tell that story to her or whatever, say this, say, well, you know, you know, she didn't, she didn't get saved. She didn't get saved. And they say that, by the way, because there wasn't any evident fruit in her life. But you know, there's a possibility to be saved and to not have fruit in your life. But there's also a possibility to be saved and have fruit in your life. And one of the fruits we want to do is reproduce people. Anyway, he went by and saw her today. And she was home. And that's why he called me. He called me to tell me about her. And she had, uh, apparently she works up north somewhere of where our church is. And she had decided finally, I am going to the church. Right? And she had got her Bible. She put it in the back seat of her car. She took off. She went to work that day. And she was on her way to the church. And an 18-wheeler struck her car in the back. Pushed her into the four or five cars in front of her. They had to airlift her to some hospital. She's been in a hospital for months and months and months. She's had to have brain surgery and all kinds of things to help heal her from the accident. And by the grace of God, she's going to be in church tomorrow. Amen. It took two years. It took two years. She's been saved. There's been no fruit. But now there can be fruit. And by the way, man, don't you want to see people reproduced? Yeah. Don't you want to share the gospel and see people saved? Listen to me. Do me a favor. When you share the gospel with somebody and that person makes the decision to trust Christ as their Savior, believe that they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and work with them as such and encourage them to come to church and encourage them to read their Bible and be patient with them. Sometimes it takes Years before you'll ever even see them in church for the first time. It takes a long time. But it's exciting to have that kind of fruit in our life. Look in verse number 8. There's a possibility that there'll be no fruit. There's a possibility that there'll be fruit. And then there's a possibility in verse number 8 that there'll be much fruit. The Bible says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. If you plant a, uh, some kind of a fruit tree... I imagine you'd expect there to be much fruit on it, right? We planted some peach trees in our house, and I'm telling you, when the peaches get on those things, the, the, the limbs droop over and touch the ground. It's so exciting. There is much fruit on that tree. My parents planted some fruit trees in their front yard, and uh, they didn't ever produce fruit, they, so they cut them down, right? <laughs> right? But God's will is that you would be one of those Christians that would produce much fruit and just bend down 
and have to touch the ground. And then look in verse number 16, one other kind of possibility about the fruit. There's no fruit, there's fruit, there's much fruit. And then in verse number 16, the Bible says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go for and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should what? Remain. And that your fruit should remain. And I believe that again is talking about the judgment seat of Christ that we'll be building with gold and silver and precious stones and we'll turn into those rewards that we discussed yesterday. So, acknowledge your position and then assess the possibilities. There's no fruit, there's fruit, there's much fruit, and there is fruit that remains. Now, having acknowledged your position, having assessed those possibilities, aspire to produce. Aspire to produce. In other words, let's get some fruit in our lives. Because it is possible that not only that we have fruit, but that we have much fruit and that that much fruit would remain. And by the way, in having much fruit comes much joy. Okay? There is joy in serving the Lord. So how do we get fruit? How do we produce this fruit in our life? Look in chapter 15 and verse number 10. The Bible says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. All right? We need to keep God's commandments, and in order to keep God's commandments, we need to know God's commandments. Look in chapter 14 and verse number 21. The Bible says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest or reveal myself to him. Do you want the Lord Jesus Christ to reveal himself to you? I want the Lord Jesus Christ to reveal himself to me. I hope that you want that as well. He tells you right here what to do if you want the Lord Jesus Christ to reveal Himself to you. You have to know His commandments, and you have to obey His commandments. By, when you do those things, by the way, you're producing fruit in your life by knowing and by obeying. Okay? Now here's what most people want. They want God okay, to reveal Himself to them before they know His commandments and before they choose to obey His commandments. But I want to suggest to you, if you want to be a fruit-bearing Christian, you've got to get the order right. Okay? God is not going to reveal Himself to you. He is not going to peel back all right, the layers. He's not going to open Himself up to you. He's not going to give you the understanding of the Scripture. He's not going to illuminate or the truths of the Bible to you unless you do your part. And your part is to dig in here to know God's will and to do God's will. And if you'll do those things in response to that, then Jesus reveals Himself to you. Okay? This is the way it works. Okay? Aspire to produce by knowing what God wants you to do, and then simply by doing what God wants you to do. And then also by depending. You can produce fruit by depending. Now, there's these prayer verses in here, this is an illustration to me of dependence upon the Lord. In verse number 7, we looked at it twice already, but the Bible says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. By the way, we're not struggling and striving to produce fruit in ourselves. Okay? We're relying on Christ to do the work through us. Okay? When you share the gospel with somebody, you shouldn't be trying to convince that person of the truth of the gospel. You shouldn't be trying to convince that person that they're a sinner. You shouldn't be trying to convince that person that they deserve to spend an eternity in hell. You shouldn't be trying to convince that person of anything. What should you be doing? You should be sharing the truths of the Scripture with them, resting and abiding in the vine, and trusting God to do the work through you. It takes all the pressure off. You can share the gospel with somebody. You can be so full of joy. You can handle the rejection that is there because it's not your responsibility. It is God's responsibility to produce that work in them. Prayer is an expression of dependence. Okay? And by the way, if you witness to somebody, boy, you ought to be praying. Before you go up and you start that conversation with them the night before, or whenever it may, if you plan to run into them, or whatever instance that it may be, God, would you please help me tomorrow? God, would you please help me right here as I'm going to talk to them? God, I sure need your help. God, give me wisdom. All of these things. We depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ in order to have the fruit produced in us. Just like a vine depends upon the branch for the necessary stuff to produce fruit there. Okay? So, it is a life of knowing, 
It is a life of obeying, and it is a life of depending. All right? So, having acknowledged your position, having assessed the possibilities, and aspiring to produce, lastly and finally, we need to accept the pruning. Accept the pruning. Look at it in verse number 2. The Bible says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. He prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You know, it's kind of interesting here. Who gets the attention of the gardener in verse number 2? All right? Those that aren't bearing fruit, he just kind of sets aside. Okay? Those that are bearing fruit, he goes to work on, doesn't he? Okay? You ever felt like God was working on you? Right? By the way, God's still working on me. God's still working on you. God's going to keep working on you. All right? But listen, we ought to be excited if God is working in us. That means we are on the right track. We're producing fruit in our life. God wants to do a deeper work in us so that we can produce more fruit for Him. Okay? So it is the one who's producing fruit that gets God's attention and He begins to do a pruning work in your life. You say, pruning hurts. And I would just say, yes, it does. Okay? Sometimes it is a painful experience we know over there. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, No chastisement of the present time seemeth to be joyous, but afterwards it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. All right? So yes, I know sometimes it hurts, but we need to cooperate with the pruning if we want to have more fruit, which, by the way, brings more joy in our life life. Okay? Now, I've got I've mentioned to you, I've got this peach tree in my yard, right? Now, just imagine for me, for a moment, that the peach tree, I take my pruning shears, right? And I go out there and I begin to prune that thing and every time I go into a branch, the branch moves out of the way. And it won't let me prune it, right? That would be so frustrating, wouldn't it? To be the gardener and to not have the plant be participating with you in the pruning process. Listen to me, God is the husbandry. God is the husbandman. Okay? He is the gardener. You are the branch that needs to be pruned and quit moving out of the way. Let God do a work in you. And sometimes God's got to cut some things out of your life so that there can be more fruit produced. Being pruned is kind of exciting if you start thinking about what God is wanting to do in your life. He wants to get you to the point where you'll produce even more fruit. Now, not all pruning means cutting out something that's bad. Okay? It's cutting out something that just shouldn't be there. Sometimes pruning leads to just a narrowed focus on something. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, pruning is selective removal. So is there unproductive parts? Yes, that they need to go. The unproductive parts, they have to go or they take the resources all right, that should be going in to where we want that fruit to be produced. All right? However, less productive parts need to go as well. Because we want, or the gardener wants, to channel the energy into the most productive parts. Okay? So maybe God is doing a work in your life, and He's saying, look, I know that you've got 15 things that are going. Maybe you need to get rid of 10 of them. And I'm going to cut them off. I mean, you shouldn't do those anymore. And I want you to just focus on these. Or maybe you have five, and I'm going to cut four off so that you just have the one. So sometimes pruning just gets rid of less productive things so that the one that's the most productive thing in our life can continue to be even more productive. And we need to allow God to do those types of things in our life. Pruning enhances spiritual growth by removing whatever it is that is inhibiting spiritual growth. And by the way, being too busy can sometimes inhibit spiritual growth. Pruning also can provide just a refined direction. Just, just it. That's it. Just a refined direction. Cutting back growth to get growth in a desired direction. Okay? I, I was pruning my tree here recently and I cut off some very productive branches because they were in the way of my RV going in there. Okay? And so I needed the tree to grow in this way because I'm the gardener and I wanted the tree to grow in this way. And maybe that's what God would be doing in your life. He'd say, you know what? You need to not do this, but you need to do this because this is where I want you to go. And by the way, we're talking about fruitful parts that are being removed so that other parts can be more fruitful. Sometimes God just wants fruit in a certain location. But whatever it is that God is doing in your life, would you participate with Him in the pruning? Because on the other side of the pruning, 
There's the peaceable fruit of righteousness and there is much joy that remains. Remaining fruit. Power in prayer. A life full of joy. Well, how about it? Where's your joy meter at? If your joy meter is not at 100, maybe it's because you're not participating with God's pruning. Maybe there's fruit in your life, and I praise the Lord for that. But maybe God wants to do a work, a deep work, a refining work, a narrowing work, or whatever it may be. Maybe there are some things in your life that just shouldn't be there that He needs to cut out. And whatever it is that God wants to do, I hope that you will submit to the gardener's hand so that you can have the joy of abiding in Christ. Isn't it exciting to know and acknowledge your position that you're in Christ? Amen. Far above the enemy? Seated in the heavenlies? Isn't it exciting to think that God could use you to produce much remaining fruit? Isn't it exciting that God is focusing His attention in, perhaps on you, and wants to do a work in your life to get you to be where He wants you to be? Boy, I tell you, let's participate with Him. All right. Father, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us today. Thank you for this Saturday night, for each person who is here. And Father, I pray that you'd be with this time of invitation, that your will and your way would be done as we give time to respond to the preaching of your word. Father, I love you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you would, just stand to your feet right where you're at. And I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment of silence as we reflect upon what God has said here today in his word to us, and that you would do business with him. And maybe the Lord is doing a work in your life. So just a few moments of silence to you to respond to what God is talking to you about in your heart. Father, I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for your word. And Father, maybe somebody here today is acknowledging the fact that they're just not participating with you in the pruning that you want to do in their life. Father, I pray that they would choose to accept, Lord, the pruning. Because you don't do anything to us by force, only with our permission. Father, I just ask that your will and your way would be done, Lord, in the service. I pray, Lord, that there's maybe somebody here and you'd say, they'd say, you know, my joy meter is just, it's just low. Father, that the truths, Lord, that we've, we've went over tonight of being in Him and the positions that we have and the possibilities of the fruit, Lord, and participating with You, uh, digging into Your Word, knowing Your commandments, obeying Your commandments, Lord, producing the fruit. Lord, that would be an encouragement and help fill that joy meter up. Father, we thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you that you love us, and thank you that you uh, have called us your friends. As it says here in this passage, Lord, if we will do the things that you ask us to do. Father, we love you, and again, thank you for the time we can spend together. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Pastor? Amen. Much for listening, and it was uh, really, really good to hear that. I know that uh, the other day we was talking to Mike Hendricks. I think it was on the men's work day. I was out there talking to him. And I asked him, I said, did you invite your mom and dad out? He says, yeah, I wanted him to come to meet a man that never had a bad day in his life. He's always smiling. And so we got to see him the other day. And it was a joy to have them here. And uh, one of the things that struck me is that I always that, that resting that he pointed out there. And uh, I found somewhere, I forget where I was reading it, but uh, the other day they said that uh, everywhere that you find grace... It always points you to God, never to self, and uh, I found that to, to be true with the message for tonight. Uh, that it's nothing that we do, it's all resting in Christ and what He does. And, and that joy, the Apostle John always talks about it, just here in John 15, also in 1 John, always mentions that our joy wants to be full, and we want to have an exciting Christian life, and I'm glad that that is possible for tonight. And uh, just thank Dustin Duke for the message. And we also have cupcakes and ice cream afterwards. We would love to meet with you, spend some time with you, and it will be a time of encouragement. And uh, by the way, tomorrow is a, a new day, Sunday. I want you to come out for that. And if you're able, invite somebody, bring somebody along with you, and bring them out to, the, to hear the message uh, for tomorrow. And so let's uh, pray tonight.
and then for the for the fellowship afterwards. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for Dustin and his family. Lord, I pray you bless them for coming out, ministering unto us. And Lord, we just thank you for all who are here. What a blessing it is uh, for people to take time out to hear. They want to hear from you, Lord. And uh, Lord, I'm grateful that we can say that we've done that tonight. Pray you bless the fellowship, the ice cream, the cupcakes afterwards. And Lord, may you encourage our hearts tonight. Lord, help us get help if we need it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.